just like see an announcement like, oh, head back to your seats or whatever. That's really yeah. All right, we're about to get started. And that quieted down very quickly. <laughs> so we've had a good morning and we're gonna keep up with that trend. So I'm glad to see so many other conservative women. It's been a while since I've been in a group of so many conservatives much less college students, much less women. It's a pretty niche area, so I'm happy to be here. My name's Eleanor. I'm with the Cal Poly Students for Life Club. That's uh, just about two hours north of here, and we work to provide abortion education and resources for pregnant and parenting students in every area of their college life, from sports to making sure they have access to lactation rooms. So our next speaker is very close to my heart, as well as a lot of other women here, based on how you uh, told us all what issues you're passionate about at the beginning of the day. Paula Scan Scanlon was thrust into the political sphere after she swam on a team with Leah Thompson for the University of Pennsylvania. She now uses this platform with Independent Women's Forum to advocate for other women who have been put in the same position as her. She has testified before the House Judiciary Committee and has been recognized from Forbes to the New York Post. So please join me in welcoming Paula Scanton. Thank you so much, everyone, for being here. Thank you for the wonderful introduction. Um, just appreciate seeing a group of women. I come and speak at a lot of conferences and a lot of colleges and a lot of different groups, and it's, it's mostly male-dominated. Um, and that's the case because traditionally men are more conservative than women, and the reason for that, from what I've heard, is that women tend to lead more with their emotions, and the liberals do a very good job of encouraging with emotion. So... I'm glad to see people standing up against that and being the, the, the party of change now for that. Um, so my name is Paula Scanlon, and many of you might already know me because I was on the University of Pennsylvania swim team where I had a male, a man, join my team. And for those of you who are not familiar with the story, I will start from the beginning, but that is what has made me well known. And it's, it's crazy to have that, that a situation that was something so negative is why you become known for something. But for me, it's really about taking those things and turning it into a positive, which is really what I've done, right? God puts you in situations and puts you in experiences for you to do better with them. And instead of just cowering down and saying, this sucks and I'm just going to pretend it never happened, you have to, to make something of it. And that's what I'm really trying to do. So... From the beginning, before I even ended up at the University of Pennsylvania, at age eight, I started swimming competitively. And at the beginning, I didn't really like it because pools are very cold and I was very skinny. <laughs> um, but I continued to work at it. And when my brother went off to college in 2011, I was in sixth grade. And um, my brother went to the University of Pennsylvania, the school I later attended. And he was very, very smart, and got into a very prestigious dual degree program. I was not as smart. I struggled with dys dyslexia, and I had a, a pretty tough time in middle school and elementary school learning how to read and doing well in my classes. But I realized something at this moment. I realized that sports actually could help you get into college instead of just being an after-school activity. And I said, okay, if I work really hard at this sport that I'm doing, maybe that can help me get to the level my brother was at. I don't have to be as smart. I can use sports and also work on my academics. And so that's what I did. Uh, in sixth grade, I began trying really hard. I didn't miss a single practice. And before the end of the year, I had moved up from the slowest person in the last lane to moving up to a completely different group. It's amazing what happens when you really put your mind to something. Um, so that happened, and I started to realize at that point, if I continued to work hard, there would be the possibility of swimming in college. So when I came um, through, through high school, I was still continually dropping time and doing better, 
the beginning of high school, I realized this is possible. I can look at D1 schools. I can, I can go to the colleges I want to with my times. And also I got my academics to a pretty good level. I was taking a lot of AP classes. And eventually when the call came in, and actually funny enough, I was actually in Los Angeles on vacation. So I was right in this area. The University of Pennsylvania coach invited me to an official visit. So it was, my dreams were coming true at 17. Um, I obviously accepted, and I later ended up committing to the school. I wanted to study computer science and enroll in the engineering school, and they had a good engineering program. Everything was working out, and it was, it was a dream come true. I attended the University of Pennsylvania in the fall of 2018, and it was challenging. It was really challenging to be a student athlete. It was really challenging to study engineering. I actually was the only engineering female student who was also an athlete in my entire grade. It was, it was hard. And my freshman year was, was challenging, but, but normal. It wasn't until the fall of my sophomore year where everything changed. In the fall of 2019, in the month of September, right, getting ready to not be a freshman anymore, not being that kid on campus who doesn't know anything, we started the season and during preseason, our coach said we had a mandatory team meeting. And I wondered what it was about. And he told us, the men are going to have their meeting first, and the women will go after. Interesting. We were a combined program. There was never anything the coach had to tell the men's team that we weren't involved in. But they did it anyway, and the men's team had their meeting, and we waited. And after the men's were men were done, they went into their locker room and started to change. But I noticed a male athlete stood behind. His name was Will Thomas. Will sat there and I said, huh, I wonder why he's still here, waiting for him to go to the locker room so we could begin our meeting. He didn't. Our coach starts the meeting and says, Will, the floor is yours. And I said, hmm, I've never seen a male athlete lead a women's team meeting. I wonder what this could possibly be about. Little did I know. <laughs> he stood there in front of the room and said, I'm transgender and I will be transitioning to join your team next year please refer to me with she, her pronouns. That was it. That was the meeting. It was no shorter than 30 seconds, and our coach just said, okay, that's it, everyone. Get in your suits and get in the pool. Practice starts in five. And I sat there in shock. I said, how could this possibly be happening? And what are the rules that could possibly allow this to happen? And is it that easy? And, I, and then I remember calling my brother, and I said, can I decide I want to join the men's team tomorrow if I want to? <laughs> Can I decide that I want to change in the men's locker room tomorrow if I want to? But nobody asked these questions. Everyone said, congratulations, this is wonderful, and got in the pool like nothing was wrong. And that was the beginning of this journey that came to the most controversial season in NCAA women's sports, arguably, I'm sure there have been others. Um, and that is how it began. And at this point, I began asking questions. I said, how could the NCAA allow this to happen? And I read up on the policy and found that it only takes a year of testosterone suppressant, whatever that means, to transition to the women's team. I had no idea what that even meant. And apparently, the NCAA doesn't even really talk to your doctors. It's just between you and your doctor deciding what you want. Crazy that you can do that so easily. And it was this situation where nobody wanted to ask questions. We all just accepted it because the NCAA, our university, and all these other people in charge, we'd always trusted that they knew best. My entire time swimming growing up, I knew USA Swimming had my back. They had great policies like safe sport to help prevent things like what happened in USA Gymnastics and other, and other things like that. I always trusted that these people had our backs, and I kept waiting for them to step in and do something, and they never did. So come forward to the fall of 2021 now. So why it was two years later is my university and the others in our league decided to cancel all athletic competition from the 2020 to 2021 season. So with this, Will, now going by Leah, was supposed to graduate in 2021. But because athletic competition was canceled, he opted to take a gap year and come back in the fall of 2021 and swim his fifth year or senior year, sort of, with the gap year as a woman. And I remember hoping that he wouldn't do that so we could avoid this entire situation. But of course, that's not what happened. 
In the fall of 2021, there was no meetings, there was no words to any of us, there was no questions asked. He was a member of our team. He had a locker like everybody else, he was in practice like everybody else, and no one said a thing. So with this, before, the one concern girls had raised was would he be changing in the locker room with us? And our coach had said, no, he'll probably use the single stall family. There's a single stall family locker room right outside of our locker room. And he was, we were told that maybe he would change in there or continue to change in the men's room like he had done for three years previously. And of course, that's not what happened. And I remember this day very clearly. I went to the coach's office because I had a question. Um, my nameplate had always been misspelled. Scanlon is sometimes spelled with an L-O-N at the end. It's my way is L-A-N. And so I wanted to make sure they got that right for my senior year. And I looked at the chart and I saw Thomas's locker there next to everyone else's. And I remember asking my assistant coach innocently, pretending that it, I wasn't trying to do what I was doing. And I said, can I have a locker on the opposite side? I really want to be in that section for my last year. And he agreed. But in reality, what I was doing was trying to distance myself. I wanted to distance myself from changing next to a man. But I didn't think about the other girls on my team who didn't have that opportunity to do that. And one of my close friends, she had the locker next to him. And what did she opt to do? She went to the coach and said, is there anything you can do? And he said, no, there's nothing. So what she had to do was she changed in that family locker room that we were told he was supposed to change in. She had to separate herself, a woman on the women's team. She was a record holder in her best event on our team. She was a champion swimmer her entire life, and she had to change outside alone to be comfortable. And she wasn't the only girl that did this. There's another girl, Kylie, at the NCAA championship that talked about how she opted to change in a janitor's closet to avoid the distraction of potentially having to share the locker room with a man. She changed next to a wet mop and some supplies for cleaning to avoid undressing next to a man. Why did us, the girls, have to be the ones that had to change our environments and change and give up our, what we had previously had to be comfortable? Because no one wanted to ask why. And it's something that this, we all went through. We wanted to wait for the NCAA to do this. We just said, we're going to make ourselves comfortable because this will get fixed. And of course, none of those things happened. And I continually just said, each hurdle that we went through, this is OK. We're going to deal with this because this will get solved. And so my university had never told us anything, but when the media started to get a hold of the situation, they wanted to come in and do damage control. They wanted to control the narrative. They wanted the image that our school and our university and our team was so supportive of the situation. So they brought in administrators and they told us, do not speak about this because Leah will be on this team whether you like it or not. So you might as well not attach your name to something that's going to taint you for the rest of your life. They told us we would have trouble finding a job. They told us that we would be on the wrong side of history if we spoke on this. They said, you'll be forever known for being on the wrong side of transgender rights, and that's not what you want for yourself. That's not what you want for your future career. And then they told us at the end of this meeting, if we objected, we should seek psychological counseling, and they gave us the number for the psychological services. <laughs> yes, it's completely hilarious talking about it now, but the worst part about it is it worked. I sat there and I thought to myself, do I need therapy? Do I need a therapist? Maybe I'm wrong. Maybe there's something wrong with me. And I went through this period, and it was not very long, but I went through this period and I said, hey mom, can you find me a therapist? And I said, and I went to my church and I said, to my church leader, I said, how can I deal with this? Do I need therapy? I asked so many different people these questions and I was questioning my own thoughts because telling 20 something year old girls that are in college that they're not going to get a job and their lives will be tainted by this, it's challenging. And so many people on the internet who give me, even on our side who give me hate for this and they said, why didn't these girls stand up sooner? Why didn't these girls say something about it? It's because that fear works, especially on young girls because girls are led by emotion, like what I was saying at the beginning. Girls have feelings and telling us the emotional appeal, saying, you're going to be on the wrong side of history for this, or you're going to be hurting somebody's feelings by speaking out. 
It's effective. It's incredibly effective. And those things about us as women make us women, and I would never change them for a day. I know that it's going to make me a good mother someday. I know it's made me a good friend, a good family member, all of these things, but they're also using that as a weapon. So it's not saying we need to change these things. It's saying we need to be aware of it and notice when we're being manipulated, and that's what I noticed myself falling into this and the rest of my teammates. After this meeting, the discussions that we had on our team were much more limited. There were Almost every girl on the team I had conversations with about how unfair the situation was. We all knew that Leah swimming on the women's team was not fair. We knew that Leah was the number one in the country when having never qualified for the NCAA championship before and ranking close to 500. We knew that. We knew it was uncomfortable to he hear a male voice in the locker room and how when he walked in or when he talked, you knew that you needed to just cover up. I had previously changed very comfortably in our locker room, but after he joined our team, I found myself sticking my head into my locker, covering my back with a towel, and trying to change as quickly as possible. I stopped showering in our locker room. I walked home with wet, dirty hair and showered at home. I did all of these things, and all of my teammates did the same. But after they talked to us, none of us were willing to have this conversation anymore. None of us were willing to speak up on what we all knew was true because of fear. And this fear worked on everyone. This fear worked on all girls at other Ivy League in institutions. I now know that schools like Harvard were sending their girls notes saying you will contribute to people committing suicide if you say competition is unfair. Racing against a six foot four tall man that's fully equipped like a male. And for those of you that have never seen Leah Thomas in person, he is six foot four with the very wide shoulders. My, my brother is also six four and he is not an athlete. And let's just say the two of them compared to each other is crazy. They're the same height, but Thomas is much more muscular and my brother can still almost beat me in swimming and he's never even swam before. That's to me shows how insane this is, but yet we couldn't even talk about this amongst ourselves. And the worst part about what happened on our team was it began to turn into a witch hunt and it began to turn into a situation where if you spoke up against it, that was something that was, there was something wrong with you. So girls would say, oh, Paula doesn't agree with, with Leah being on our team. Isn't she such a bad person? When those same girls just a few weeks before had agreed with me that it was so wrong. It turned to this group of girls that could have been supportive of each other and could have helped each other stand up, but instead it was using disagreeing with the social issue as a way to boost your own social circles. There were girls who were using this as posts on social media saying, look how supportive I am of progress. And the progress they were pushing for was men taking trophies and spots away from real women. That's the progress they stood behind because society had made them feel popular for posting that. And it, and it was sad. And, and I struggled with this for a long time because I had valued friendships with these girls for so long. I valued my teammates and I valued these people in my, lives, in my life, but I started to see how easy it is for you to be emotionally manipulated by these things. Of course nobody wants to be a bad person. Of course nobody wants to be told that they're a bad person. And in some ways, it's easier to just be quiet and move on. And I tried my best during the season to speak up about this. I did a lot of anonymous interviews. I appeared in the What is a Woman documentary, but I was a dark shadow, and I know maybe some of you have seen that. I mean, you can kind of tell that it's me now that I'm out, but I did what I could. But upon graduation in 2022, I said, I don't want this to taint my life like my university told me. I don't want this to ruin who I am and who I've become and all the things I worked for. So I went on and I graduated and I started my corporate job in New York City, working as a product manager, making very good money, using my engineering degree and doing what I was told was the right path. And I did this and I tried to move on and I said, it's okay because other people will step up and change this. I said, the NCAA will change their mind. I don't have to speak up about it. The University of Pennsylvania will write their ways. I don't have to talk about it. But of course, 
In the year of working, that was not what happened. What I noticed was this kept happening happening to more girls. And of course there were people speaking out about it. Of course there were. Riley Gaines, a super close friend of mine, she was speaking up about it. But she's one voice. Why? We need an army because they're so loud. You can't have one speaker, Riley Gaines, against thousands of haters online and, and show up protesting or rallies. It's, you can't let one person take the, the fall for all of this. And through my few months of, only working a few months, I, I started to see this. And I saw how, how much this was affecting me. I would, I would come home from work and I thought I had a dream job. But in reality, I was working for a finance company and I was just making the lives of traders already making millions of dollars better. What change was I actually making in the world? I wasn't. I was making already rich people even more money. Um, and, and I would come home from work and I would feel unfulfilled. And I would, I would feel bad because I could see these situations happening to other girls and nobody really knew what happened on my team. Nobody knew the emotional manipulation and how to see through it and move forward from it. And that's what we needed. Everybody knew the story of Leah Thomas and everyone could see how unfair it was. But the tactics these universities and the NCAA and all the institutions pushing for this used was not clear. How can you fight against something if you don't know what they're doing? And I started to realize that's why my story was important. And that's why me speaking out about it would be so powerful and so important. And I eventually made the decision about 10 months into working that I needed to speak about this. And eventually I did. And obviously it's come to a lot of people wanting to hear what I had to say and a lot of people being interested in the story and interested in seeing what the university did to me. And a lot of people interested in understanding the psychology of it even, which is, is so true. I mean, I never even really saw it that way until being very far removed from it. The abuse, to tell girls that their feelings don't matter. Like what Riley was saying when she was given the trophy, um, when Leah was given the trophy instead of her, she said that she was taken down to a photo op. And I saw the same thing in my team that said, when I saw my teammate, right, have to change in the locker room Leah was saying, uh, was supposed to change in. It showed me that us girls were the ones that were being discarded being put aside and our own feelings didn't matter and it didn't matter what we said and they were telling us that our voices and opinions didn't matter. They said, this situation is going to be the case no matter what you think about it, so you might as well get on board. Why? Why should us women get on board? Why should us women be second class citizens to, to men? And what I saw happen on my team was that one male athlete, just so he could be happy and be his authentic self, the Voices, the feelings, and everything else of the 40 other girls on my team are completely discarded. And speaking out, I, I wasn't sure how, how this would come, but I've seen already the impact that I could have. Um, so more recently, I'm not sure if you guys have seen, but the women on the Roanoke College swim team, their D3 school, they were faced with the exact same situation I was. They had a male athlete on the men's team, Transi say he transitioned and want to join the women's team. And because I had shared my story, because I had shared the emotional abuse, the conversations that I had in my locker room, the conversations that the university put onto us, they were faced with the same situation, but they had the tools that I wish that I had had. And they knew to, to how to see through what they were being told and see through the emotional manipulation that was hap happening to them. And they stood up all together and said, no, we don't want to have a man on our team. And it worked. The university actually said that he wasn't going to be on the team. I think I'm not sure if the university decided or he quit himself or what the situation was. But whatever, however it happened, they won because they stood together. It took all of them being together and united to stand up for what everyone in the world knows is true for this to be successful. And in a lot of ways, I'm very thankful that they were able to do that, but I'm also jealous. Where was that on my team? Why couldn't my team work together and see through what we were going through and see through the manipulation we were going through? But I don't blame my teammates because I know that we didn't have the correct tools. And that's why I can see now why me speaking out has been so powerful for them. 
how seeing through how this happens and the tactics they use and how they manipulate you, that's so important as well. And something I just think a lot about in this particular situation is I always waited for other people to do to do these things for me. And a lot of them, I trusted men. Men run the NCAA. Men are very powerful. But uh, Nikki Haley in the first debate, she said, if you want something said, ask a man. If you want something done, ask a woman. And I loved that quote. I was there live actually to see it, which is another perk I've gotten from speaking out. I was invited to the first presidential debate, which was insane. Um, but that's really what showed me that it's up to us women, because this is our territory. This is our sports, and of course the men should speak about it. Of course the men should talk about these things, and we need their voices, and I have a lot of male family members, and my brother who I'm super close with, and other men that I work with in this space, and they're helpful, but if we can't do it ourselves, why can we expect them to do it? And if I'm not willing to risk my own career, and so, quit my own job, which is exactly what I ended up doing. I, I was worried about my career before I spoke up. I worried about what my consequences would be, but if I wasn't willing to risk those things, how could I expect anyone else to do it? How could I expect a man to speak up about it when it wasn't even his territory or his situation? If I'm not willing to do it myself, then who's going to? And that's really what I want to leave all of you with. That's what this entire situation has taught me, is that you have to be willing to do things for yourself. You have to be willing to see through when you're being manipulated. Don't let your feminine features and your nature as a woman be used against you. Of course, you should embrace those things and they make you wonderful and they are part of you. But also don't let that be manipulated. And with that, I leave all of you with just say, you have to go out and do it yourself and take those negative things you've gone through and turn it into something positive. Because I know that I'm not a victim from what I went through, but what I do know is I can use my experiences to help all of you, help other women, and what I saw on the Roanoke College swim team is one voice really can help an entire team of women to not have to go through it again. So thank you. Paula, thank you so much for your talk. That was amazing. I have uh, kind of a question about like how do you address LGBTQ issues? Um, I guess like from a secular perspective, because I think the foundation that I really rely on is religion because I think like God made us with a purpose and like just because you're given an illness or you're from birth, you're, you struggle with like different health things. That doesn't mean that you entertain things like, you know, trying to change your body medically. And so I think a lot of people on the left will say like, you're struggling with an illness, you're stigmatized, you're marginalized. And so you matter more and we need to give you more attention. But I guess, how do you find a foundation to argue against that in a secular world where people are like, okay, well, that, you know, men and women aren't, they don't have inherent value. Like your body doesn't hold inherent value. Yeah, that's something I think about a lot. So obviously myself, I am religious and I open up to this when it comes up and I'm not hiding away from that by any means. But I do also encounter a lot of people that are secular and don't have the same beliefs that I do. The biggest thing in most social situations um, is that there's always two groups and it's one thinks that they matter more than the other. And the question here is that this comes down to is do our rights as women matter more than the rights of transgender individuals? And something that they'll, they'll say is, oh, well, they can't play sports at all if they're not on the women's team. So my argument to that is if you're a male, you can play on the men's team. Nobody's saying you can't be on the women's team. But for us women, we can't move over and go to the men's team because we'll be killed. I mean, if you see, like, not, not even not like that way, but like figuratively, um, men are so much stronger than us in every sport. If you look at swimming, running, volleyball, every single sport that's played, they have an advantage over us. 
So my response and my argument for this is, okay, they, those individuals have a place in sports. I believe everyone should have a right to play sport, sports, but they don't, um, but we don't have our own spaces. So why can't we have this category that's fair for us? And they have the category that's fair for them. And a lot of people will say, well, we don't want to play sports at all if we're not in the category that we choose to or we identify with, but why? Right. And so they're going to continue to argue that. But my, my take on it is we need to deserve our own fair spaces. They're more than welcome to be in men's sports, but our sports are for us. And I know a lot of people disagree with that, and it's controversial, but my argument, again, is we're not banning them from it. We're just saying we have categories for a reason. There's other sports that have weight classes, right, like wrestling. Well, who's to stop me from saying I actually identify as uh, 92 pounds? <laughs> like, how do, you know, like, well, and they'd say, oh, that's crazy, but it's really not that different. Sports classes and classifications exist for, for fairness and for for maximum competition and maximum entries in it not to kick anyone out and so that's really what having women and male women's and men's sports does and so that's that's my stance on it and again we're at a time where that answer is controversial and people will still argue with me but that's what I believe you I hope many of you in this room also agree with that stance but that's what I would say to them thank you yes Hi, um, I was wondering if you deal with Title IX policy um, and if Title IX policy enables um, transgender uh, men to um, come into sports and women's sports. Yes, so right now, Title IX is currently in the process of being rewritten. Oh. Yeah. Um, so with the current written way Title IX is written, this is a violation of Title IX. Of course it is. We are women, and our opportunities are being taken away by men. But the current administration is trying to rewrite that. And so what they're, word on the street, what they're attempting to do is they want to rewrite the term woman to mean anyone who identifies that way, which is completely insane because that's a circular definition. So in the time being, there are avenues to pursue if this happens to you at a state school, you can pursue legal action and say, I'm going to sue, I have a man on my team. But the issue with that is the way Title IX applies to a lot of private institutions is a little bit unclear. And that's um, the University of Pennsylvania where I attended. It's a private institution. There have been many lawyers who have approached this and said, maybe we can find some like litigation to do to, to have prevented this, but it was challenging. So right now, Title IX potentially won't protect us anymore, which is insane. They, with, they actually stopped the rewrite. Uh, they were supposed to release it earlier, and they are reconsidering, whatever that means. So I'm very curious to see what they come up with. And if it does get changed to be this new definition, it will be very damaging to us women, not just in sports, but in colleges and in schools. So um, that's all I have for you on that now. But it, it is scary that they're, they're willing to do that, and they're willing to rewrite what we are. Yeah. Thank you so much. Any more questions, ladies? Oh, come up. Yes. Hi, my name is Alexis, and I commend you because I was a former swimmer and water polo player in high school, and I know how mental, how much mentally this sport is, and. Um, having something like this event happen like can really affect your mental health and your confidence and everything and um, yes yeah, so I commend you on that and my question was how did the other teams respond like when you were going against other teams in swimming and did they were they on like your side did you um, were you um, speaking with other people on how to speak out about this and, uh, and other teams or did they kind of conform to um, this new like feminist like movement about joining like men joining the women's team yeah so I actually had a lot of friends who also swam in the Ivy League um, and one of my closest friends we were had known each other swimming since we were eight years old I when this situation was unraveling I, I texted her and I just said like hey you know what do you think about the situation and she texted me back and said don't talk to me 
And this was a friend <laughs> I had been friends with for like, you know, so long, 15 years. And that is really, and this was early on in this season. That's really when I started to realize, okay, these emotional manipulation tactics that are being used on me that I've seen through are being used on other girls. And mm -hmm. that was clear when actually Harvard had a letter that was leaked and I touched on this briefly during a speech that they were told that they would be contributing to suicide if they mm -hmm. spoke up against this. So no, most girls in the swimming world were not willing to talk about this. There have been a few others. Obviously, Riley was one of the first that said, enough is enough. This mm -hmm. is insane. And she spoke up against it. But in the Ivy League itself, my league, very limited number of girls have even said anything at all. Mm -hmm. And when you approached girls to have conversations, they would just say, don't talk to me or it's complicated. I want everyone to be happy. Mm -hmm. So... Yeah, and, it, and that was hard for me because, you know, that's something why I've been trying to encourage more people to do it together as an army is that there's strength in numbers. It's true. It's a social thing. I had dinner alone last night, and I know how uncomfortable being alone in anything is. And you're sitting there, and I'm like, everyone's judging me. And that's, and that's how it is, speaking, speaking alone. Um, but that's why, you know, you rely on other people. And I, that's why I texted my friend and said, maybe she'll have the same opinion as me, and that'll encourage me. And she didn't. Or she probably did and was too afraid to say it. So that's really why it's so important we empower each other and do it as a group. Thank you. Yep. Thank you for what you do. Uh, just to your opinion. So would you consider the women's movement as being dead? Because I don't hear a word from them and. Yeah, so the issue with that is I've noticed in this whole situation is that a lot of feminism and these ideals that have previously existed have really just been part of the Democratic Party. And in the same thing with the Me Too movement, I've had previous things. I wrote an op-ed about uh, the dying Me Too movements and the failures of it, is that a lot of these movements are not about bettering women. They're not about women's rights. They're not about our well-being. They're about pushing political agenda. And this is something, I don't talk about this a lot, but this is the right audience. Something I see with abortion all the time is that they're saying this is a women's rights issue when the realities of what that is is not something that is discussed or shared. And that's why this women's movement is not touching on this because it's not about preserving women's rights. It's not about empowering women. It's about pushing political agendas. And the Democratic Party has decided that Individuals who identify as women are more important than people who are actually women, which is in completely insane. And that's and that's why it's so crazy when I speak about these things and people say, oh, well, you're a Republican, you're against women. And it says, no, I'm not. I'm actually thinking about real women and I'm thinking about how these policies affect women. And that's something that I don't see them coming back on. I think they're too far down the rabbit hole and we have to start our own feminist feminist movement. I'm hesitant to use that word, but I mean, truly it's, it's our own new movement and it's a new wave. And I would have never considered myself a feminist before any of this, but maybe I'm like a new type of feminist. So, and maybe we all are. <laughs> yep. What a terrific talk. Thank you so much. And thank you for what you're doing. And thank you for coming all the way out here to talk to us. Um, <laughs> And you're interested in doing campus lectures? Yeah, I've been doing a few. So if anyone here wants okay. me on their campus, let me know. <laughs> we have great, uh, we have great uh, funds to help somebody like you go out to the campuses. And if you need security, we'll have security for you. Thank you. <laughs> but thank you so much. Um, really grateful to you. And uh, hope you'll join us for lunch. We have lunch, uh, 1150. We're pretty much on time. And we will uh, convene again at 1250 with a wonderful speaker here on foreign policy. The timing couldn't have been better with all that's going on in the world. But thank you so much, Paula. Thank you. Thank you, everyone.